we have lined up for you tonight. I know I say that quite a lot, but listen, guys, this is going to be absolutely off the charts because tonight we're going to be welcoming back Ilana Freeland, but in an extra special broadcast. She is going to be bringing with her a very special and important guest as well. You are not going to believe who we have got on here tonight. And Johnny Whistles, my co-host, you're along here for this magnificent show. Uh, can you believe this, Johnny, the guests that we've got here tonight? Kev, I, th- I think you once mentioned that Elana was the mother of CERN. Well, I think we just found the daddy. Well, she was the mother of Harp. And I definitely think we have found That's the, one. the daddy of Harp. But, Johnny, <laughs> before we get there tonight, we've got an absolutely huge week lining up on KBS next week. A show that you've put together on Monday with somebody called Darcy Clark. And he's going to be covering alternative medicine. Then on Tuesday, we've got the Nano Girl. And on Wednesday, the 13th, we're going to be joined by Zen Gardner. And then followed by, wait for this, folks, on Thursday, the 14th, we're going to have Andy Bashago. And he's going to be coming on here to talk about the DARPA and the time travel projects. Johnny Whistles, another big week next week. But I can't think of a show as big as this one tonight, man. So you go in there, do the chat room, and we'll get right into it. I'm in there just now, Kev. Tinfoil hat area. We've got 31 people in there just now, so thanks everybody again for turning up in the numbers. We start with our friend, Mr. Bill Demarest. We've got Brendan O'Shea, Calvin Long, Carl Sanders. We've got Caroline Smiley. We've got Karen's Carrie Schwartz McDowell, who is fighting tooth and nail to keep this common core out of the school. So well done to you, Carrie. Good honour. Daryl. We've got Daryl Walls. We've got Devlin. We've got Gaz, Jeff Phillips, Ifearian, John Tater was here. We've got Joy Williams, great to have you back, Joy. We've got Julie Gostiner, we've got Karen Bernard, Kenny Robinson, Kev Baker, Lucky Man, Lynn Metcalf, the lovely Mary Sharp, Michael Scott, Nancy Lalonde, Pencris, myself, Real Joe Wood, Rhys Bevan, Mr. Sam Ramirez, the lovely Sarah Clough, Scotty Jones from Canada, Stephen Gray, we've got S Virtue, Time Lord, and the last one in there just now, Kev, number 34, is Tony Phillips. Absolutely fantastic. So let's not waste any time tonight because we've got so much cutting edge information to cover. And that's thanks to our first guest tonight, Ilana Freeland. Now, just a little bit about Ilana. She has been a Rudolf Steiner school pioneer, teacher, lecturer, storyteller, and writer. She has written for alternative publications, edited the stories of survivors of MK Ultra and ritual abuse, and is still ghostwriting books on diverse topics. Now, she's the author of the book Chemtrails, Harp, and the Full Spectrum Dominance of Planet Earth. And she is currently looking into something that is called the Space Fence. And like Johnny said at the start, I do call Ilana the mother of Harp. And she's back for her second visit tonight. So, Ilana, welcome back to the Kev Baker Show. Oh, it's so glad to be here. I really love your show. And I I really love how Johnny reads the names of all the people in the chat room because we're all in a big school now together. Absolutely. Uh, We'd be nowhere without the listeners, Ilana. Well, and I often think of how... We've been so conditioned to think of expertise uh, as being something that you go to college for and get a master's or a PhD. And now we're living in a space age, which is cutting edge. And just about everything that's going on now is, uh, is breaking news. And it is time for us to realize that shows like yours are our classrooms and uh, we we have some amazing, I mean, the, your guest lineup for next week is amazing. Uh, so I'm really happy to be one of them. And you know, when they say, there's an old saying, Ilana, that when the student is ready, the teacher will turn up. And that is honestly how it feels running this show. It's a blessing 
to be able to bring experts like yourself and our other guests tonight on to speak to myself. I'm trying to learn, as is everyone else out there. So I really appreciate your time. And tell us who you've brought with you tonight. Oh, yes. I am so privileged to bring Billy Hayes with me. Um, Billy and I try to do as many shows as we can together because it's fun for us, uh, especially when we get into the latest topic of the space fence. I mean, without Billy, I don't know that I would really be attempting this, uh, this incredible Herculean task that I've taken on to write about the space fence, which... To me, at this point in the writing, I'm, I'll be done within uh, a couple of months. is is like uh, is like I'm uh, it's like I'm wrestling with uh, I don't know if you know the constellation Ophiuchus up in the heavens. It's the thirteenth constellation. Thirteenth house, I certainly do. Yes, yeah. yes, and he's he's standing in the Milky Way, uh, and he's wrestling with a serpent. And that's exactly how I feel. But let me tell you about Billy. Um, He has an amazing life. Um, I'm just going to read one paragraph out of the bio that I usually send out for him. Facebook and radio audiences have sought Billy Hayes' expertise for years without realizing the price he has paid for his this extraordinary expertise. Known as the Harp Man, Billy was a tower erector, shadowed his entire life by U.S. government agencies and the defense contractors that work for them. He is also an MK Ultra survivor. So for multiple reasons, I am in, uh, in deep gratitude to Billy as he, he has the technical expertise and experience that I lack, and I suppose my skill is primarily in being able to weave together a big picture for laymen to understand what an amazing electromagnetic age we're living in. Absolutely, and we are constantly bathed in electromagnetic soup. So would you like me to bring Billy on to the show, Ilana? Or would Absolutely, you like- yeah. Billy. Billy, welcome to the Kev Baker Show, and it is an absolute privilege and an honour to have you join us tonight, sir. Howdy. I hope everybody's got their tinfoil hats on with a pyramid uh, shape to them. Absolutely, <laughs> Billy. And I believe you've actually got fires close by where you're living right now. So I hope you're okay there, sir. Yeah, so we're in the middle of four wildfires right now. <laughs> Don't know whether we're coming or going. Now, you know, all these tinfoil waders out in the chat room and on the streams right now, One of these topics that we come across quite early in our awakening is something called heart, Billy. And we've all got our own ideas about what this ionospheric heater is. But you literally helped to build this thing. Could you tell our audience about heart? Well, let me start out by informing you that I was a erection specialist for putting up towers and such, and electronics, uh, through a company called, uh, oh, he, oh. General Dynamics? No. <laughs> E-Systems. Um, and I met up with, uh, Gerald Bull and, uh, Bernard Eastman in, uh, Sacramento to test out an antenna system in 1986. I did not know at that time that this antenna system was going to be for ARC. At, at that time, uh, it was just not heard of. Uh, it was very secretive, and uh, the people I was working with were very compartmentalized, where nobody knew what was going on. And we were assigned to put up under contract with uh, ARCO, uh, the first antenna system at uh, the Conan, well, actually, we were at Fairbanks and Anchorage, where, where the test sites were. But eventually, uh, we put up the first quad of antennas in Dakota, Alaska. And uh, my crew did the first four phases of installing all the equipment for the HARP system. 
Now, Billy, I can imagine if you were one of the installation experts at the time with this compartmentalization that we see all throughout the government in these operations, did they ever tell you at the time what this was specifically going to be for? Or was it just another antenna? It was just another antenna. Everybody there was only there and had information of their need to know. If, if they didn't need to know, then they weren't told what they what there was. Their part of the job was associated with any other part of the job. Uh, this is was how they maintained the secrecy of nobody knew what was going on except for the top honchos. And and I, and I want to interrupt Billy just a second. That's what people need to realize. How can you keep a secret for decades? This is exactly how you keep a secret. You compartmentalize on a need-to-know basis. And Ilana, it's like a jigsaw. If one person only has one piece of the jigsaw, it's impossible to get the full picture, right? Absolutely. And you know, Billy, we're, nowadays we have these ionospheric heaters all around the world. Now, what is your take on the actual purpose for these things? All of them are, are as a voice. Ionic spheric heaters. Each one has a capability of uh, orientation of certain areas that they maintain, uh, striking the ionosphere. Well, it used to be just the ionosphere. Now it's the atmosphere. With the introduction of uh, uh, nanoparticles in the air, nano metal particles in the air, now we have additional phase that they're falling where they don't have to require as much power to incarnate a plasmatic effect. Wow. Now, Ilana, this plasmatic effect was something that we touched upon the last time because they're basically turning the whole of the atmosphere into a plasma. Is that not correct? Yes, and it it's also, I think, a little easier for people. I mean, what plasma is, is the fourth state of matter. It's actually um, a gas, uh, a, a substance, and, uh, and fire, and it can be heated tremendously. So um, right now, what's, uh, I think what people understand better is that the atmosphere has been made into a battery, and it's, uh, or, or like an antenna. So what we experience as air that we breathe is actually loaded with conductive metals on a nano scale that we are breathing in. And um, all of this has to do with military agendas and operations uh, and, and the conquest of space, as I'll explain in the Space Fence book. But uh, I think the thing that I'm most irate about is this has been done completely undemocratically. Uh, there has been no choice for populations around the globe to become guinea pigs uh, who are breathing in all manner of nanoparticulates, the heavy metals only being uh, one part of that. And I, I'm really very irate about that. You know, I think these metal particulates are going to play into this space fence as well because I really worry about the fact that we are getting kind of all these nanotechnology inside of us, Elana, because... I really do feel after we had something like Jade Helm and the AI test that was carried out there, we're basically all being assimilated slowly into this AI system. Or maybe I'm just going a bit too tinfoil. No, I think you're right. And I think the way I would, I would say it is that with an ionized atmosphere, with a, with a conductive battery-ready atmosphere and conductive metals in our bloodstream and in our lungs, in our heart, beyond the blood-brain barrier, uh, we are plugged in to what is being created around us in our previously natural environment. Yes, I would say you're absolutely right. Billy, do you want to add to that? Well, let's put it this way. Let's look at our atmosphere as a vacuum tube, electron vacuum tube. It has a heater in it, it has uh, a grid in it, it has a plate, and it has an anode. When you light up an uh, amplifier and you, you 
create a massive amount of power. You get a scorching of the screens uh, and grids where it's overloading the grids. This is plasma, you see. This is energy, plasma energy at work on electron tube. When you see that uh, electron tube turn cherry red, you're looking at the action of plasma. Our atmosphere is like that vacuum tube in the sense that it is a vacuum. The higher you go into the, an altitude, the closer you get to a vacuum. If you can electrify the sides of this vacuum and charge it up with positive and negatives and store it, then you and have then have a way to initiate a signal through this then you have an amplifier. And when you get to a point where you saturate that amplifier, it goes into a plasmatic effect. And in this plasmatic effect, you get a cyclotronic movement, which is a, mainly speaking, it's a, a vortex, an electronic vortex. It goes round, round, round. That almost like a particle accelerator, Billy? Yeah, basically, basically, yes. And it becomes a torsion field. Exactly. Once it reaches a point where it is totally loaded, then you are in to the torsion field remedy. And we, this is a whole field of energy by itself. And you know, this torsion physics is something that we keep hearing about time and time again from various guests, Elana. This is the kind of physics that the cutting edge military and everyone else are working with yet is occulted from the public. And it has to do with our bodies. Uh, Billy mentioned a very important term, cyclotronic resonance, and this is something that not only Bernard Eastland mentions in his HARP patent in 1987, but it's also something that Robert O. Becker, MD, talked uh, very much about in the two books he wrote, one being The Body Electric, about how we ourselves are, are, we are resonating to what is being basically broadcast through this torsion field. And Billy and I have had several conversations about one of the biggest concerns is the terahertz. We are, we are, we are going into a very, very deep area that uh, could even influence the DNA. Billy, why don't you talk a little about terahertz and uh, the digitalization that's gone on? Okay, the higher the frequency you go, the shorter the wavelength. The shorter the wavelength, the less area that is consumed by an antenna and the electronics. You, you can make a, uh, your electronics diminish in size, your antennas can uh, be as small as a micrometer. Um, stand by. That is absolutely tiny, Ilana. Oh, yes. Billy, is there a fire? Oh, I hope Billy is okay there because, yeah. like I said at the top of the show, guys, there's actually fires in that area now, Ilana. I didn't yeah. even appreciate who Billy was. I'm sitting here. My jaw <laughs> is hitting the ground. I can't thank you enough for that. And I think we've got yes. Billy back with us. Here he is. I'm sorry. I had to mute. The alarms were going off uh, in, in the neighborhood. The fire is pretty close. Are you going to be able to stay, though, Billy? Do you need to go? Well, I'm pretty well protected. I, I burnt off my lawn, lawn the other day. So I yeah, got this is. This is the second big fire they've had there, Kev, within two weeks. And you were telling me the weather there is really, it's strange, it's erratic, it's all over the place, right? Yeah, Kansas, yeah, uh, 13, you know, 19 degrees one night, 81 degrees the next day. Uh, it's crazy. Go ahead, Billy, about the terahertz. Okay, terahertz is so small in wavelengths that it starts to get to the point where it can maneuver single particles of atoms. Uh, it involves moving portions of molecules around, mixing up molecules 
where you can actually derive a, a, a pharmacy in the air. It can also develop to the point, this is what they're trying for. They're trying to develop to a point where they can manipulate DNA and RNA components, where they can elect to what that DNA is going to be. You know, that ties in, Billy, with something that has just happened in the UK here, because we've just opened the first ever synthetic DNA lab. And this place is run by robots. And what it does is it takes digitized DNA, sequences that are made up entirely by a computer, and then it prints out the chemicals, the chemical markers that then go into the DNA. And voila, they plant that in a cell. And they say they're going to use this to grow things like biofuels and future medicines. Just think of that, the same principle. Think about being able to do it remotely through a frequency, through pulses of, of uh, data, digitized data through the air that you could manipulate portions of the brain to think certain ways, to manipulate actual DNA of a, of a body, of a living item to make it what you want it from, from a distance. And Billy, can you target this individually or is it widespread? Their attempts are to do it digitally, identify every living thing on this earth where they would have some control of every living thing on this earth. Wow, now Ilana, this really makes sense then when we hear yeah, about... This is- yeah, this is a space fence. Yeah, yeah, this makes sense as well with the metals that are currently going into our bodies as well because they're literally turning us into antennas. They're tiny antennas. Very good. Yes, exactly. Well, they're, they're inject, uh, suggesting that we will be in, instilled with many computers. I say many, micro-sized computers all throughout our bodies. And you yes, know that- This is the thing, Ilana, because some people fear about, well, will it be an RFID chip that we take or something under the skin, something like that. The really shocking news is that we're already being wired for this system. Yes, yes. There are many sensors. We've read articles about the release of, of billions of tiny, tiny sensors that are already bringing information back to supercomputers. I think that uh, you have to assume not just the sensors, but the microprocessors are also swimming in our bloodstream. And you know, they've got a supercomputer or a quantum computer called the D-Wave. Now, one of these D-Waves is owned by Google and NASA. And there's also one that sits right at the heart of CERN. Now, I'm not sure if you guys know too much or if CERN ties into any of this, but Billy, does CERN at all come into this? Absolutely. Every time the CERN makes a rotation with its magnetic fields, it is endeavoring a cyclotronic movement. And it itself produces a torsion field, is that not correct? That's right. It also creates a cyclotronic resonance. And when you think of uh, of CERN, Think of the magnetosphere because it's affecting, it's impacting our entire magnetosphere. Well, and Ilana, on CERN's own website, it even says that at times it generates an electromagnetic field 100,000 times stronger than that of the Earth. And that's not me saying that. That's on their yeah. own website. That's right. That is so right. And um, I think that uh, sometimes when people are talking about these time anomalies of uh, missing time, um, suddenly, you know, there are a couple of minutes that are gone and seem like they never happened. And also, uh, I always remember the uh, Indonesian, uh, I think it was MH370, the flight that uh, sort of just dropped from the sky uh, during one of CERN's fire-ups. What does it do to the magnets? And on top of that, we had the German wings. 
This is the Camp Baker Show. He's in broadcast of the Kev Baker Show right here on your number one network. 100% listener supported truthfrequencyradio.com. I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. And what an absolute treat, a pleasure, and a plethora of information. This is going to be one of those shows that really raises the bar right here on KBS and something that I feel we'll all have to listen to a couple of times, just to digest the information that is coming across here. And Ilana is going to help me in the second half of the show here to get the very best of the information from Bill. It all ties into something called the space fence. Before we go on, you know, just before the break there, we were touching on digitized synthetic DNA. And isn't it amazing how that all ties back into the news and the information that we covered with Anthony Patch and Gons from Face Like the Sun and Chris from End Times Matrix. You know, some people say that this harp stuff, it's all outdated and everything else. And you see, this is us bringing you the very latest cutting edge information on how it fits together with that CERN machine as well. So then, over to you, Ilana, because Billy's having a few problems right now because of this fire in his location. Hopefully we'll get him back. But like I was saying during the break, this show is open to you and Billy anytime you need it. And we're going to be talking about the space fence and how this all relates. Well, let me start uh, with, uh, you were, you said something interesting to me that, uh, oh, the harp thing, it's just kind of old stuff now because we've had that nifty acronym around for Oh, almost 20 years since uh, since Nick Begich wrote Angels Don't Play This Harp back in 1995. And I thought he was the daddy of harp. How wrong could I be, Alana? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I'm sure, you know, we can share the daddies. We yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, no, Nick, Nick is just a great, a great guy. Um, so, yes, harp was what it said it was in a sense that it was a research project and it was um, attempting to bring uh, energy down from the atmosphere. Okay, Kev Baker, here we are back. They can't stop us, folks. You know that. Now I'm going to bring everyone back into the show really slowly. First up, I'm going to bring Ilana back on. Ilana Freeland. Hello. Is Ilana. It would appear somebody is trying to play about with this telephone call. <laughs> Imagine Please. that, Ilana. Imagine that. And I'll try and bring in Johnny Whistles now, and we'll try and bring back Billy as well. But it's not surprising that we get interference on shows like this, is it? No, none whatsoever. Now, what are we going to be going into while I try and bring Billy back? Well, I just want to go over how the um, harp and the other ionosphere keters and all of the other equipment play into the space fence, into this what I call the planetary lockdown that we were discussing regarding the uh, the terahertz. Absolutely, and we've got Billy back with us. We are all here. We're all live. Let's see how long we can last now. And is everything okay at your end, Billy? Audio check, I don't know. Yes, you sound loud and clear. So, Ilana, take it away. I'll pass it to you and see where we want to go. Yeah, I I just wanted to clarify that people who think that the harp thing is old hat uh, and how it plays into the coming space fence, uh, planetary lockdown, I I like to call it. Um, You had the, uh, the experiments run by harp up in Gakona, Alaska. Tremendous power. A uh, tremendous steering mechanism uh, really um, brought in massive information and the ability to uh, to really unite the upper atmosphere and the lower atmosphere in the sense of an energy transmission from uh, one to the other. And as Billy indicated earlier, sort of turn the lower atmosphere into an ionosphere that could be uh, pumped and uh, could be used to store energy for various uh, military projects. So that's that's kind of what happened. HARP was shut down. 
in I think 2014, uh, and it was uh, recalibrated. Uh, and Billy knows about that. And it uh, was then um, uh, restarted recently. And as Billy said, it's it's now going to be working with many other ionosphere keters and radar installations and SBXs and all sorts of things in order uh, to do weather, to do different operations. I named seven in my book on chemtrails and HARP. Uh, and now it, it, it has been transformed into one of many uh, so that it can, they can all be calibrated to create uh, the uh, space fence. But we haven't mentioned some very important parts of the space fence. But Billy, how should we proceed? I don't want to miss out on talking about the wind farms and their role in, uh, in this uh, pulsing and frequency. Oh, hang and on. That, Did you say wind farms, Ilana? I come from yeah, the land of wind big, farms. Yeah, you have a big one over there. I just heard about it, yeah. So, Billy, do you want to cover that first? Okay. Well, let's put it this way. In order for all this magic to work, you have to be able to charge up the atmosphere, maintain a, a, uh, a charge on the atmosphere to ionize anything. In doing so, the weather can do it. The, uh, the movement of, of particulates in the air moving through a flux field will charge up the atmosphere to a point. It's the biggest motor or generator of this world, is the weather. It, it, it incites more electricity than any other uh, component of this world, including anything man has ever made. Now, man is catching up by, by utilizing wind farms to pulse charges into the air. Not only do these instruments create green effect electricity but they also are improvised to develop a pulsing of static into the atmosphere. Every time the blade goes around, a fiberglass blade goes around it discharges as soon as it crosses its supporting pendulum. It discharges the two blades in the air. So for every revolution of that windmill it will pulse three times per revolution. That pulse is charging the atmosphere above it. When you've got a wind farm, then you have a massive uh, power supply that's creating voltages up in the millions and millions of volts that are in the atmosphere. When this discharges, it creates a lightning effect that is so short that it's not even seen. It's like a super flash that you don't, it's so fast you don't see it. Billy, is that like the sprites that we see, the ones that shoot up the way? Absolutely. This is what the, the intent is, is in envision a, a lightning that's just starting lower into the outer space to Im, impact the outer space charged area to fire off sprites. And, you know, Billy, where I work, I do security and I walk around and it must be within two miles away. I see an absolutely massive wind turbine. And Johnny and everyone else in Scotland will tell you that they absolutely bombard the air with particulates here as well. And now I'm starting to get a picture. Why? Right. Well, this, this is what the intent is. This would not work without having a conductive means in the atmosphere. You have to have that way of storing a positive charge in the air. And in order to do so, they have to uh, in, inspire particulates, metal particulates, and dielectrics into the air. This would be the barium as a partial dielectric, the aluminum as a conductor, a very light conductor, which they can keep airborne. Uh, aluminum is one the lightest metal known to man. It is the lightest conductive metal known to man. This is why they're using aluminum. I forget how you say that word in your country, 
Aluminium. Yes. Oh, well <laughs> done, Elena. I like that better. Aluminium. Um, Billy, as long as we're with the wind farm, let's talk about the fracking because it plays a similar role. Absolutely. Every time there is a pulsation release of a pulses via radio frequencies, in order to make a wave move through the Earth's atmosphere, you have to have a ground wave and you have to have a sky wave. In order to maintain a good ground, you have to have a grounding base that is resonant to the frequencies that you are going to utilize. It just so happens all oil wells are designed that at 7,285 feet, they are insulated. So this, this rod into the ground, this casing into the ground, is resonant to the frequencies that need to be provided to create a resonancy of these frequencies. Otherwise, you've got an antenna in the ground. At each one of these fracking sites, they dump a salt and metal material down the hole in the inspiration of fracking. They're dumping all these metals and all these toxic uh, materials down these holes. They say to get rid of them. But the real fact is, this is creating a pulse within that area of uh, 7.5 to 12 hertz. Every time... Is this like why we see a lot of small earthquakes around these fracking sites, Billy? Absolutely, absolutely. This is the, the every volcanic uh, motion, every earthquake has its resonant frequency. And so, are, you, uh, Kev, are you getting uh, the picture of, of how many <coughs> parts there are to this space fence? Absolutely. It is absolutely massive. And I didn't think there would be this fracking component to it at all, Ilana. Yeah, Billy, what else uh, should we add to that? The radar installations or uh, well, you know, what about, Billy, oh yeah, like the lasers, the Starfire laser? When you fire a laser through these components in the air, you improvise a waveguide for all signal, uh, transmission line for information to be passed or electrical energy to be passed. And, Billy, it basically creates, like you say, a wave, isn't it? Because if this is anything like what they're doing at CERN now with the AWAKE project, they fire a laser beam through a plasma, and then they have a witness beam with the particles on top, and they're supercharged. Absolutely. This is, this is the same, basically the same thing, only this is being done above our heads. Well, CERN is beneath ground. Uh, using a magnetic field to improvise the same thing, movement of, of these beams. And accel- in their case, they're trying to accelerate up to and near the speed of light. In harp technology, what you're trying to do is amplify, amplify that, that energy. Do they amplify that then by heating up that area where they're doing all this? Absolutely. Just like on an electron tube, you heat it up and get those electrons moving. Then you introduce a power source to it and something to regulate that power source, which is normally a grid or a screen. And this is how amplifiers work. You give it, uh, you turn it on, you turn it off. You can turn it up to make it pass more or you can turn it down the pass less. Wow, and Yolana, are you starting to see now why the network call me the geek? <laughs> <laughs> it, I think it's a sign of, of excellence to be called a geek. So do I, I really do. I love all this stuff. But Yolana, I was looking at this Lockheed Martin space fence today. And you know, when you look at the public face of it, it looks all very quite innocent. Dealing with debris. 
up in the lower <laughs> Earth ob- orbit and medium Earth orbit, but it is far from friendly. Well, and Billy and I were talking about that, I think, yesterday, about how it's spread all over the place. So you're getting news reports of this going up and that going up and this contract being so many millions and and it's going up in the South Pacific and then we have down in the South, we have three. And But you've got to put it all together to see how massive uh, this project really is. This is this is the SDI project. This is the culmination of the uh, strategic defense initiative, the Star Wars thing back in the 80s. We're there again, only this time um, they are really, really going to try to uh, attempt it because now they have the ionized atmosphere. It's and everything. This is SDI on steroids, Billy. Yes. That's what I, we've been trying to tell people for the last two decades. <laughs> <laughs> Billy, Billy has been doing this so much longer than I, and I'm so happy that... Um, I, I just feel like people are waking up, but there's still a sort of antipathy to things being too technical. It's as though, uh, you know, it's anti-geek, as you say, Kev, and that's too bad because I'm I, I'm just learning so much from Billy and from all the reading I'm doing uh, to figure out this technological age we're living in. I do feel it is incumbent upon us to know where we live, when we live, and therefore find out a little more about why we live. And you know, Ilana, what I will do is, I've done this with Anthony Patch, and I try and make it into more understandable language, and I use analogies for people so they can get it as well, people that aren't into this kind of physics and science. And I'm going to be digging into a lot of study. I've got four days off coming up. I think I'm going to be calling on Billy at some point as well for some of his expertise and I'm going to do my best to try and get this across to the listeners because this fits with absolutely everything else we've been covering from the digitized DNA back to CERN. And now we've got this satellite space fence to deal with as well. Fracking's incorporated. This is huge. Oh, don't forget those windmills over there with John. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's, there is this fact that uh, Scotland is building the largest offshore wind farm that exists. There is a race for these wind farms to have the biggest. You know how many is. Mine's bigger than yours. Well, it's on, fellas. That's exactly what it's like here. And you know, Scotland, they are so invested in this. And it says, wind power is Scotland's fastest growing renewable energy technology. But as we know now, it is far more than just powering the odd house. Here that's, or there. that's what this is all about. They throw up a cover and they don't tell you the whole story of what's going on. I mean, the space fence, harp, uh, chemtrails, it doesn't matter. You can't get all the information. They, they, they desensitize so much of this information where it's not available. And what happens is you're told one thing while a whole bunch more is going on behind the scenes. Now, Billy, yes. with the same plasma atmosphere that they're creating, if we were able to get a hold of the technology, it could be a game changer, could it not? Could we not have the likes of Tesla it, technology? It, it, it could be free power, just like Tesla was trying to uh, encourage back in his day. Yeah. But our problem is, is the military gets hold of every time there's something that comes up, they try to weaponize it. And that's what's happening. This is a matter of power. And Billy, it, it occurred to me because Scotland is in the northern latitudes. Um, let can we can you say a couple of words about uh, Operation Deep Freeze, and uh, and the magnetic poles themselves? Right. The closer you get to the polar regions, the more you have control and advantage to having control of the magnetosphere from the polar areas. Remember, the po- each pole is, is a flux field to the other pole. And when you can be close to that point of that polar sequence, then you have the attitude of being able to have better control than anywhere else. Well, guess what? 
the polar regions are moving. The polar north and south are moving. And guess where they're moving to? Down near to Scotland. That's affirmative. It, it, it will eventually wind up somewhere near Russia. And you know, Billy, for the listeners out there, if they can picture a ball with strings coming out of it, out of the top, and then going down to the bottom. I mean, like Billy's saying, if you're right at the top of the ball where all of those strings come out initially, then you control the entire grid around that ball. Right, and the magnetosphere is nothing but loops of magnetic fields that surround the Earth from north to south, just sector by sector by sector by sector. And Billy, could they almost dictate where this migrating pole goes to when they pulse the uh, magnetic field with CERN. Oh, absolutely. Because that must have some effect on those lines of force, right? Absolutely. When you when you mangle flux fields, then you are disintegrating or remaneuvering other fields, magnetic fields. We have a problem with a planet or an asteroid come near the Earth. It creates a magnetic uh, distortion of our magnetosphere. It changes the whole overwhelming contortion of, of the torsion fields. And therefore, it's eminent that there will be problems in our electronics, in our body functions, in our communications, everything. Wow, Ilana. Now we're almost, we've got a few minutes left, Ilana. Have you got anything you would like to say before we disappear tonight? Well, um, I want to remind people, I I mean, I I keep hearing how complicated uh, my book, uh, The Chemtrails Harp and the Full Spectrum Dominance of Planet Earth is. I I don't think it is complicated uh, because um, I'm not really complicated, at least in this, this field I'm not. Uh, I, I just want people to know that if they can uh, really quicken their thinking and not just their feeling uh, of uh, looking for some personality out there who can uh, give them courage or g- give them a little bit of knowledge that gives them courage, uh, it, we, we are here to learn what is going on in our time. We are here uh, to to really develop our minds and uh, turn the tally off uh, and really, uh, really take hold of ideas so that we have the courage out of true knowledge. And uh, a lot of people ask me, uh, what can we do? What can we do? Well, that, that is the first thing we can do is just, you know, get the book, read a little bit every night, uh, read aloud to each other. Um, don't, don't worry about the footnotes unless you're going to do more research. And um, I hope that, that the Space Fence book will, will also be like that. Uh, I certainly am struggling a lot more with this book than I was with the Chemtrails Heart book because a lot of the information for the Chemtrails Heart book was already out there. And all I did was consolidate it and bring in uh, independent scientist Clifford Carnicom's work on Morgellons, which I considered to be very, very important to our health and our immune system. So uh, that's what I want to say to people is I appeal to you, don't be afraid of uh, a little learning and uh, and learning what is going on in this world that we have uh, in one way or another chosen to be born into uh, and our children and our grandchildren. I mean, all these generations are coming. We really need to take hold of this information. Ilana. I have to credit you for the way you do put things across in a really understandable way. 